So when you purchase cryptocurrency, you can keep it online in a hot wallet or offline in what is called cold storage. Now, online wallets are easy to get access to, not only for yourself, but potentially for hackers who may find vulnerabilities within the site or the exchange and take that money from you. Now, putting the currency or these tokens on a hardware wallet, they have their own issues. That being, you could lose the physical device or worse, forget the PIN number that you use to protect what is stored on it. My longtime friend, Joe Grand, an early hardware hacker and former teenage phone freak, which means getting free phone calls back before they were free and unlimited. He was a member of Low Fat, Loft, is that right, Joe? Loft. Loft. Loft Heavy Industries and founder today of the Grand Idea Studio. Now, he was hired in 2021 over the summer from a man who had forgotten his PIN number and lost what had become $2 million in cryptocurrency. Joe, welcome to the show and tell us about your digital legitimate hacking adventure. <laughs> That's right. Thanks for having me. It's great to see you. We go way back together. Um, yeah, so, you know, I grew up as a hacker. So when, when people contact me all the time with questions, can you hack this? Can you do that? I received an email from somebody who said, hey, I have a, a, a hardware wallet uh, that I bought some cryptocurrency years ago. And uh, it turns out I don't remember the pin. And now the value is worth $2 million. Can you help? It was actually like a pretty well-written email. So I'm like, all right, this maybe isn't a scam. Uh, so I arranged a Zoom meeting and, and met up with this guy. And it turns out, yeah, he was legit. Um, you know, I was intrigued because I love learning new skills and kind of solving puzzles. And this was one that was intriguing to me. I wasn't traveling at the time and I was at home and it was just the perfect timing. Uh, so really, I kind of have some pieces to show like this is what he had. This is a, a Trezor One hardware wallet. And that's connected via USB to your computer. There's a little display on it to show like the, the padlock or whatever. And the, yeah, the... so there's the, there's the USB connection, there's a display. So that's going to show you uh, the address of what you're, of who you're sending to or if you, you know, the, your money on here. And it basically stores your private key on here. So you need physical access to this in order to initiate your, your crypto transactions and things like that. Um, so there had been some known attacks against this Trezor device before. There are various diff different versions of firmware for it. Um, and every time, you know, a vulnerability gets discovered, Trezor will update the firmware and patch that problem. So this is the same thing that happens on your MacBook, right? You get an update to fix Safari or fix the OS, right? Um, exactly. Same. It's a, it's a cat and mouse game, right? So anytime somebody finds a security vulnerability, a, a good hacker, so assuming they publicize that or they work with a vendor to fix it, Hopefully the vendor fix that problem and, and makes it more secure for future users. Which sucks the, for you as a hacker because now you can't fall on those old methodologies, right? Exactly, yeah. So every time a problem gets solved, then you have to say, okay, how is that patched? Can I, can I still attack that? Do I have to find a new vector? In this case, and with everything really, you know, not everybody updates their devices. And for the one that came to me, it was running an old version of firmware that was known vulnerable to certain types of attacks. So I figured, hey, I, the research is out there. I could just go and replicate this work and it should be easy. It's a hardware-based attack uh, using something called fault injection, voltage glitching, where you're basically kind of causing a brownout in the microcontroller and the brain of the system to misbehave. It's right, so just think, the right time to defeat security and then you can do all this other stuff. So this is like um, when you try and start your car and your car is going, yeah. rrr, 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 rrr. it doesn't have enough voltage. And it, what you're saying is when the chip doesn't have enough voltage, it goes into another mode that's less secure. Well... Yes, if you time it just right at the exact time during the boot cycle and all of these, all of these different kind of technical uh, parameters, if you get that right, you can effectively reduce the amount of security and then from there take advantage of some other problems in the code to extract the recovery seed. So I thought it was going to be easy to do and it ended up taking three months of time to perfect the attack to the point where it was reliable uh, you know, not just giving a talk at a conference to show it, but to actually do it on somebody's wallet that had real money. Um, and and so you, I got to by the, the way, you can't of, do this but, on the legitimate wallet either. You have to do this on other wallets because there's a time bomb inside these too, right? Oh, that's right. Yeah. So this particular wallet, uh, there's a, a pin number associated with it. You can choose up to a nine digit pin. And these guys thought they had set a four digit pin, but they actually had set a five digit pin. So they had tried a bunch of times to unlock it, but there's a limit to the number of times you can uh, enter your pin before the information gets erased from the device. Oh, and they only man. had a few tries left. So they're like, forget it. We need to you know, solve this a different way. 
So what'd you do? You bought a bunch of these devices, the same model number, you put the same firmware on them. Yep, I, so I basically got a bunch of what I call reference devices. So I bought a bunch of legitimate Trezor devices, loaded the exact same version of firmware so I could try doing my attacks and prove to the owner um, that I could do this and I wasn't you know, just, just faking stuff. That's right, because he, he didn't have trust in you yet either. He knew you were an a inventor, a hacker, but you had to show that you could do this on a sample device. And you were probably doing it on a four-digit pin too because that's what they all had in their head. Well, it turns out that I didn't even, the attack that I'm doing doesn't matter what the pin is. It doesn't matter what the recovery seat is because I'm actually attacking the microcontroller itself. Okay. Um, so I could set my own pin and set my, you know, set up a new wallet with a new key and then prove, like write that down and then prove when I was successful. Oh, cool. But there's a whole story about it. Like, you know, The Verge had an article and then I have a video that that came out. Dude, your um, video that, has more than 2 million views now. How cool is that? <laughs> that's right. 2 million views for uh, for $2 million. And um, that goes through the whole process. You can actually see the real hardware hacking process and how long it takes to do the attack and how kind of nerve wracking it is to wait for it to happen. And, you know, I included my family in the video, which is not something I normally do, but it was really a family process because I was working on this for so long and I would come inside and explain stuff to them and they're not, you know, hackers or technical yeah. or whatever, but they would listen and just let me kind of vent. So it was really, a, it was a fun thing to do as a family kind of in this still, you know, lock, lockdown kind of period over the summer. Yeah, it was a perfect COVID experiment. And Keely, your wife, she's a lovely lady and definitely not technical. Um, and your kids, did they get inspired to be hackers or legitimate hackers like their dad has become? Um, not really. You know, they, they love gaming, so they're into that. Um, they understand what I do because they've been surrounded by it for so long. And I've introduced them to soldering and, and hacking and yeah. all of that. They've sat in some of my talks in my classes, but they're not really into it, but they thought it was cool, you know, to see this. What I explained to them is with the fault, fault injection, here's, here's actually a version of the circuit board inside. Yeah, so, so, so normally those little pigtail wires aren't on there. So you had to go through what yeah. would be called like a JTAG adapter, which is how they put firmware on early devices or tell us what you did. Yeah. So, so basically there's two different versions and, and um, when I was getting this set up, what I was explaining to my son is I said, you know, I'm trying to glitch this at just the right time to defeat security. And he's like, so it's like a video game, right? When you hit the buttons at the right time and maybe somebody finds some weird bug you can do. So that's basically yeah. what I'm doing. Um, so this is the hardware that's inside and it's a microcontroller, general purpose microcontroller with some buttons and a display and the USB connection. So after all of my research and, you know, figuring out the best attack, I had to basically instrument the board with a bunch of connectors on the side and another little connector here. And essentially these connectors go to uh, what's called a, a serial wire debug interface, which is a JTAG type of interface, which is an industry standard debug interface to allow you, if you have access to connect to the microcontroller. Yeah, or maybe put new firmware on memory. it or load, load some, but this is yeah, done by the engineers that make the product, not guys like you at home. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So that, that, that interface is used for development. Usually, you know, anything engineers can use to develop a product we as hackers can use also. So it just happened to be connections on the board that were accessible, even if they weren't accessible, I could, you know, still solder to the pins of the chip, but I was using that as a way, because if, when the security is enabled, you're not allowed to use that debug interface, even though the physical connection is there, oh, the, they lock the it chip out. won't respond. So by glitching, by causing that brownout to happen at just the right time, I can trick the chip into saying, oh, there's no security and downgrade to the next level, which then gives me the debug access I need to then go read the recovery key that had been placed into a certain memory area inside the chip. So, so it was a, a very wild attack uh, to, to go through and a lot of, lot of different pieces of hardware and a lot of different pieces of code. Um, it's like magic and seeing it work is like every time, you know, even, even today, I'm still doing some glitching experiments right now. And, and um, it's just every time I do it, it's, you know, it's such a trip. It's so cool. Well, I watched your video and I, I will put a link in the video in the show notes here. Um, it was so cool to hear it uh, say, we'll talk about what the message was real quick. This was clever. Oh when, yeah. When it lo so, locked. So one of the things during the, the, the attack process is you're basically trying lots of different attempts over and over again. And that's power cycling and injection at the right time. The boot yeah. up happens. Yeah. So all, so all of these things happen um, that we're basically waiting for. And I set this wide range of parameters because I wanted to make sure I didn't miss the right spot of where we were glitching. So I had set a, a little thing on my, uh, in my code. So when there was a successful hit, it would actually say through the text-to-speech uh, program on the Mac, hack the planet. 
uh, which of course is a throwback to you know the 1990s era hackers movie. Yeah, uh, and school. it was cool, you know, hack the planet. And um, when you hear that, you know, it's like we jumped up and down, and then we're super excited about it. Hey, Joe, speaking of the 1990s, didn't you and your friends visit uh, the Senate? What was <laughs> That's that about? Right. So a very young Joe Grand. Um, in 1998, I was part of a hacker group called The Loft, uh, which was seven of us basically uh, in a clubhouse experimenting with electronics and, and hardware and software and networks and hacking on, our, on, on things that we had. And then we would help uh, the public or help vendors, you know, I notify them of problems and, and hopefully they would fix them or help them get fixed. Uh, but yeah, sort of sharing a good side of what hackers can do. And we got, we got invited to testify in front of the Senate, uh, which was basically the government wanted to know what could seven essentially kids doing on nights and weekends, you know, what could they do against government infrastructure and satellites and banks and all these things, because the internet was so young back then that it, it, nobody really expected it to be what it is. Yeah, Amazon and was it, only selling books then. <laughs> yeah, they were, right, and, Je and, and Jeff was you know, probably manually packing them. Yeah. Um, but we were the first seven people to testify in front of Congress with fake names that weren't in the witness protection program, which I thought was kind of cool. And my favorite of this Senate hearing was you guys... We're in front of a senator. The senator said, now, is it true you could take down the internet? And without breaking a smile or a chuckle, you guys are like, oh, yeah. Yeah, so <laughs> that, was, that was something that Mudge said, one of, one of our guys, that you know, any of us could take down the internet in 30 minutes. And um, his concept was basically because of the way that BGP routing works and some of this low-level kind of internet architecture stuff. Um, I, would, I would never say that I could do it, but he could do it. <laughs> and some of the other guys could. And when we saw when we saw Facebook go down recently, yeah. that was exactly that same problem, the BGP routing issue. Um, so really, you know, nothing has changed except more people have gotten involved in, in computers and the internet has has gotten, you know, we're relying on it even more than before. Yeah. But a lot of these core problems remain. And it was crazy as like a 22 year old kid to go there and, and do that was pretty cool. That was also my first public, uh, my first time speaking in public, which was a little wow. bit scary. Yeah, and our, our departed friend Dan Kaminsky was working on a lot of these problems with DNS, which has tons of vulnerabilities to this day. Yeah. So, oh, you're, you're bringing back such good old memories, Joe. Thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, I see you put up a, a crypto hacking website. Is it uh, offspec.io? Yeah, it so, you know, one of the things we thought would be fun after doing this process is like, maybe we should offer these services to other people who need help. So we put up a, a temporary website. You know, it's not the greatest looking, offspec.io. And uh, we've gotten hundreds of, of emails already of people who need help or they've been scammed and, and all sorts of, you know, things related to, to cryptocurrency, which is fascinating. We can't help with all of them, of course, but there's some really interesting cases. And uh, yeah, you know, it seems like cryptocurrency isn't going away, whether you like it or not. It's, it's kind of here and it's, it's changed the way that uh, kind of technology and computing and, and finance is happening. That's so cool that you're into this. I love the re-enthused vigor towards hacking. And what I love yeah. most about it is you're not going to go to jail for this. You're going to get paid. So speaking of that, how much did you make on that two mil? You got a, you got a bounty, right? We'll just say it was, we'll say it was, uh, it was a fair amount. Okay. It was worth the effort. All right. Hey, Joe, good to see you, my friend. Keep up the good work. And uh, we'll check in with you in the future and see what other magic you're uh, unlocking there. For sure. Thanks again for having me. All right, buddy. Bye.